The whiskey, the kilts, the clans, the haggis, the tartans and tweed, the highlands, the lowlands, the links, the landmarks. When you cross the pond, leave your preconceived notions behind because you've only just begun to scratch the surface. Fusing a proud pedigree and time-honored traditions with forward-thinking, cutting-edge technique and innovative technology, Scotland is now. Any and every adventure to Scotland must come equipped with some time spent in the country's capital of Edinburgh. You have buildings that look like they're thousands of years old next to modern architecture, and it works. In a town known for its designer duds, Stuart Christie holds the distinction as the oldest bespoke tailor syndicate in the city. This place reminds me of some out of like a movie. Like stepping back in time. It is. There's even like an aroma of like... Dusty of, memories. Yeah. <laughs> Dusty memories. <laughs> exactly. And while this shop has withstood for nearly 300 years, today, for the first time, the institution is in the care and custody of a woman, owner and creative director, Vixie Ray. I grew up in this area just five minutes away, and I used to walk past this shop when I was young and be quite scared. It was sort of men's tailoring shop that I don't think I would have ever come in, and now I own it with Dan, my business partner. 40, 25 and a half. Whoa. Hold <laughs> that. No, let me suck it in. That's a weekend, and in the weekday. There we go. Do you find it now, people being more open to women being in this industry? Certainly for me, it has been. With getting involved in the Tartan Authority, it's very male-led, and I'm now the first lady member in the Incorporation of Edinburgh Tailors. Congratulations. Yeah, it's uh, the first lady in 500 years, which is fantastic. I'm a very indecisive person, and I mean, with all the options you guys have when it well, comes to the fabrics. That's why we're here, we're here to help. Let's go to the blues. This one here, Uh huh. this is perfect for a three-piece suit. This can go with a lot. If Stuart Christie traditionally has had a way of doing things, why modernize? A lot of the brands we have here are very good quality, but they just need a little tweak and a little modern touch, and mm -hmm. I think that that's what I bring to the collections. When you're choosing the lining, you would always choose a fleck in the linings. This one's got beautiful emerald. Ooh! I think that's beautiful. I do too. They didn't have social media, they didn't have website. They didn't have a ladies' collection, so I've been able to do everything and not step on anybody's toes. There she is. The way society is, we're all about technology. Absolutely. So you guys are almost taking it back a step and you're I going back so. to the days of when it was made by hand. Yeah, I want to slow fashion down. I think it's too fast. I want people to appreciate the craft that goes in and the time that goes into making a suit. Just cutting this with these shears, you could feel the thickness and you the could weight. feel the weight and the texture of the fabric you're using here. And this is, I mean, this is serious it's stuff. Right. It shouldn't be just, you know, factory made. Now watch your fingers. Okay, don't stick my finger under the needle. Here goes nothing. Woo, look at that. How does it go from picking a style, picking a fabric, to then the finished product? For the bespoke service, it's 14 to 16 weeks. 14 so. to 16 weeks? Yeah. You um, give birth to a child in that time, I think. No, you couldn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you plan on taking Stuart Christie and what do you see for its future? I would like to work on a global brand that people know is completely made in Scotland with a little bit of a modern touch. I see the way you're looking at this suit. Eyes other direction because this suit is bespoken for. Pubs, pints, drinks and a dram, Scotland is an incredibly spirited place made even warmer with a diverse collection of locally produced spirits. And under the careful curation of bar owner Kyle Jameson, the liquor library at Nauticus is as vast as it is delicious. What do the Scots love to drink more? Whiskey or gin? To be honest, it's getting on par. Why do you think that is? I think growing up, we were always told like your parents might drink gin or your, or, or your grandmother yeah. drinks gin. The old ladies drink it. Totally, yeah. But then again, it's just the resurgence. That is refreshing. While the great debate between gin and whiskey may never be won, you don't have to choose at the brand spanking new Borders Distillery located in the southernmost region of Scotland. How many distilleries are there in this region? In this region, there's only one, and that's us. The last distillery to operate in the Borders closed in 1837. So there was no distilling in the Borders region from 1837, 1837 until, until 2018. 2018. Yeah. 
Is this traditional distillation methods or are you guys using like cutting edge high tech methods? It's completely classic system, very, very simple, mm -hmm. but we've designed everything around not using energy. You smell that. It's oh my God. I almost want to jump in and go for yeah, a swim. Yeah, yeah. All of our equipment is very close together, mm -hmm. so we don't move energy far. Our ventilation needs no electricity. Very efficient heat exchangers, insulation, means that we're running this plant at one third of electricity consumption of a normal whiskey plant. Oh! <laughs> it burns! That's yeast doing its thing. Our barley only comes from our region, from local farmers. Our water comes from underneath us, from a well. You're distilling with environmental sustainability in mind. Completely. We make today for stuff that will be drunk in tomorrow's world. And that's the future. That's the future. And while a majority of the spirit becomes whiskey, some is set aside to produce gin. Once you've done your fermentation, we steam our botanics in ethanol okay. and extract the flavor that way. Whoa. Yeah, that smells sweet. It smells the, like fruit, man. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's tasty. You really pick up the juniper notes and the citrus notes, and there's no bite, there's no burn, there's no bite to it either. Nice and smooth. I feel like you've brought me to the Garden of Eden and I'm sampling the forbidden fruit over here. First look is sponsored by Visit Scotland. Head to visitscotland.com for more. In the Gaelic native tongue, the Scottish word loch means lake or inlet sea. It doesn't even look real. This looks like a painting you'd hang on your wall. With a writhing coastline that seemingly stretches on infinitely, Scotland's brilliance will leave you looking for words and very likely at a loss for breath. It's just serenity. But it's the manner in which those waterways are monitored, protected, and revered that's advancing the country's overall culinary scene forward. Standing here and seeing how beautiful and majestic this landscape is, you can see why sustainability would be one of the cornerstones of Scotland. Yeah, I mean, I think aquaculture is a very new form of farming. You've heard of agriculture for many years, so aquaculture. 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 So so agriculture on land, aquaculture, aquaculture in the sea. Simon Briggs, Richard Hunt Smith, and the seafood company located at Loch Fine on Scotland's west coast are bringing a treasure trove to market. Briny oysters, sweet langoustine, mussels, scallops, and of course, Scottish smoked salmon. It smells smoky. We smoke our salmon using chippings from retired whiskey casks. Fire in the hole! This is the funnest part of the job. The salmon that we're looking at, is yeah. this wild caught? All the salmon here is farmed on the west coast of Scotland. These fillets look absolutely phenomenal. The methods that you use to not just cure the salmon, but to smoke it, fillet the fish, it really shines through in the quality, the taste. I mean, just the appearance. Higher standards, better product. That's exactly it. The farm raising process, it's to increase sustainability and lessen the impact on the environment. If we were to take wild salmon, the salmon would have been gone many years ago. So you're not depleting any wild stock. We have a motto at Lot Fine, how worthy of honor is the sea. So in my view, that means we will always leave it better than we found it. Would it be frowned upon if I grabbed one of these fillets and took a bite out of it? Unfortunately, yes. But what's harvested from the waters is only half the story. Uh, Come on. Who's hungry? You often hear free range and farm raised. Yep. And I mean, this is essentially witnessing that firsthand. These guys are outside all the time, yeah. rootling about in their yeah. paddock. Then it all it all comes down to quality. Absolutely. Quality, uh -huh. taste, flavor, and supporting locals, keeping this place going as well. The fresh produce and assorted livestock tended to by fifth generation farmers like Jane and Grant Brand of the Brand family, East Fortune Farm, and celebrated chefs complete the culinary picture. So Tom, how important is it for you to be able to come out to the farm, see the livestock that's being raised, and how much of an influence does that have on your seasonal menu? Oh, massive. I mean, it's so important that I come and see what these guys are doing. But at the same time, there's the cattle farmers, mm -hmm. the vegetable growers, the fishermen. It's the whole collective thing. Yep. 
Within Scotland's robust culinary community, one chef stands out amongst the rest. Last name Kitchen. That's a very <laughs> unique name. Yeah. I mean, it kind of works. Classically trained, Tom Kitchen was the youngest chef ever to be awarded a Michelin star for his namesake restaurant, The Kitchen. Located within the Leith neighborhood of Edinburgh, a distinction he's maintained for over a decade. So it's not just earning the Michelin star, it's keeping it yeah, as well. You've got to keep it every year. And capitalizing on an impeccable reputation within the city streets, Tom's taken his passion for locally sourced Scottish ingredients a bit closer to the source with his latest project, the Bonnie Badger, nestled in the quaint village of Gullin on Scotland's east coast. How would you describe Scottish cuisine overall? There's a whole new movement which is starting. Often we're taking classic dishes and we're twisting them into a new modern approach. In a sense, that's exactly all we're doing is we're just enhancing what's here already. We're going to do a lamb pie because we love a pie here. You, you know? guys do love your pies. <laughs> we do. Everything's a pie, a fish pie, <laughs> beef pie, lamb pie. Yeah. How would you describe the ethos and the inspiration yep. behind your menu at your restaurants? Is this traditional Scottish cuisine or is this kind of Scottish cuisine with the Tom Kitchen flair? This is Scottish cuisine with the Tom Kitchen flair, but it is very much homely food, pub food, country food, that kind of thing. You've actually taken techniques from other places around the world and you've incorporated them into 100%. Scottish cuisine. And this blows your mind. If you think yeah. you go back 10, 15 years ago, yeah. this was non-existent. Woo, hot pies. Is there something unique about Gollin where you were like, this is where I want to start my next restaurant? Oh, we're in the most beautiful beach, about 200 yards down that way. And, you know, picturesque, white sands, beautiful. It's only half an hour from Edinburgh, you know? That is delicious. That is juicy, that is flavorful, that is tender. It's incredible, man. This isn't just a restaurant, it's also an inn. Yeah, it's an inn. My wife's dream has always been to have a small hotel, you know, something that she can create, something really special. We have 14 bedrooms, and it's really like we're inviting you to come into our house. Mm -hmm. We're trying to think about families, we're trying to think about tourists, we're trying to think about what locals want, and then we're trying to merge all that in together. I'll drink to that, my friend. Cheers, my friend. Once the country capital, it's been said that he who holds Stirling holds Scotland. And sunrise in this historically strategic city is like taking a step back in time. But the legacy lived here is being breathed new life by contemporary storytellers like Charlie Allen and the team behind the Clan Ranald Trust. We set up the trust to get kids out of the classroom and get that total hands-on feeling, you know. So you're saying books have a place in the classroom, but so do crossbows. <laughs> no. <laughs> we set it up as a charity because I didn't believe at the time that people should pay for their education. Investing over two and a half million pounds earned from acting and historically consulting on feature film and television projects like Outlander, Outlaw King, and Gladiator, Dunkaren, an exact replica of a medieval fortified village, is at the heart of that mission. <laughs> wow. This is impressive. Committed 25 years of my life to this. You want to talk about a labor of love? Yeah. Right? This is a hell of a doorbell here, Charlie. This is a battering ram. It was donated by Russell Crowe. No way. Is this essentially a way to not only keep Scottish tradition alive, but also to educate the modern generation to what life used to be like back hundreds of years ago? So if you're doing an overhead attack, so you're here, yep. it's just that. Got it. <gasps> yeah, because, I mean, where else are you going to find something like this? There's certainly no other place on a scale of this. No, not at all. Um, yeah. To bring kids in and give them that experience, they're never going to forget it. You know, you say this is for teaching kids, but I mean, this is essentially like the coolest adult fort you could possibly imagine. Well, we're all kids at heart anyway. Exactly. I do believe that we've touched just as many adults, if not more, than children. Sterling Castle, this place is absolutely magnificent. Yeah, it's stunning. It's been around for a long time. Uh, the records go back to around uh, the 7th century, when it was a fortification then. It was Alexander I in 1107 that actually built the castle. So there's been multiple inhabitants of, of, uh, of Stirling Castle. Yeah, a lot of kings. So we had, what, Edward, James IV? And James VI also, Mary Queen of Scots. The first boss lady. Yes, and a boss lady she was. <laughs> 
But what else in the town of Stirling is there to do for visitors? Ah, there's lots to do. I mean, it's, it's a very historic town. You've got the King's Gardens down below. You've got the jail, the old jail. So you had the Robert the Bruce monument over there, and then you have the Wallace monument over in that direction. And not forgetting the Bannockburn Visitor Centre. You've got a, a very good interpretation centre there that gives you a full in-depth account of the battle, and you can recreate the Battle of Bannockburn as you think it would have been fought. It's quite, quite spectacular. And I love the fact that it's an amazing way to bridge tradition and the modern times together, and it's enabled you guys to bring history to life. Yeah, we call it living history. Living history. Are you not entertained? Dundee has a fantastic history. In the 21st century, it's working hard to reinvent itself and culture is part of its future. We have great art galleries, theatres, music, and we're at the heart of a beautiful countryside. How important is it for the city of Dundee to have the V&A Museum here? V&A Dundee helps bring to the city a further world-class attraction. First opened in September of 2018, the Victoria and Albert Museum of Dundee is situated within an architectural masterpiece made to mirror Scotland's northern cliffs. And its halls house an unparalleled world-class design collection. V&A Dundee is a museum that is about creativity, about culture and about our heritage, but I think it's a museum about all of our heritage because it is to do with design, which is part of everybody's lives. While there are elements of art in design, there's also a big difference where design has practical applications in, in society. I think that's exactly right. The first Speedo ever made, also called the Clamshell Dish Trainer. Interesting name. You guys distract the guards, I grab it, we split it 50-50, huh? Okay. Test your engineering skills and build a bridge. In essence, it seems like design touches all aspects of life and the VNA is just a place to bring them all together. That's right, and there are many more aspects of design that we would like to look at in the future. I have to say, the future for the Dundonians is bright. When it comes to golf, a drive is typically your first stroke. And that's worth noting, because in under a 30 minute drive from Dundee, you can hit the links at the legendary St. Andrews. Oh, oh that's sad. I hit the ground. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll pretend that never happened. Golf was born in Scotland during the 15th century, and the sport as we know it today, the classic 18 holes, was constructed here in 1764. Well, what's this called? Addressing the ball, posting up to the ball? You're addressing the ball, yeah, All absolutely. Right. Flexing right. the knees, back nice and straight, but tilted forward. And I love going that direction. Get up at it. And while the old course is clearly the iconic draw, it's the modern day technology and staff, like Director of Instruction Steve North, who are able to decipher it, that are keeping you clear of the sand traps. What do you call it, a trackman? Trackman is called, yeah. That is a radar system. It came out of the Danish military, believe it or not. So it used to track ballistic missiles. You're gonna need it, because I'm gonna be launching missiles that direction. Oh my god. We didn't quite get a 370 yard drive. Um, well, that was, my, that was my warm up. Swing. Well, fair, fair enough, we'll give you that. How does this know my spin rate? So you see a golf ball has uh, dimples all over it. Yeah. What it does is it works out how it's moving. Very clever technology. It's insane to have something be able to tell you this many statistics right off the bat. Oh, yes. Yeah? Yes, Johnny. 213. Do you think that the guys that built this beautiful golf course could have ever envisioned something this spectacular? No. It does kind of open your mind to think, well, What's going to happen in the next 10 years yeah. or next 50 years? Once you're able to perform like a pro, you might as well challenge one. Great form. Thanks. And while golf was known as a gentleman's game, Scottish powerhouse Rachel McQueen is proving that the future of the sport is positively female. What was it about golf as a young girl that was attractive to you? That I could beat the boys. It's all right. Yeah? <laughs> I'm so good at slicing, I could work at a pizza shop. The satisfaction of being able to play a sport where anybody, any age, any sex, all abilities can tee up and play together yeah. is amazing. So Rachel, are there any rules I should know about when we're uh, on the golf course <laughs> that I should follow? Well, etiquette's a good one to start with. So at the top of someone's backswing, you don't usually talk. Did I do that? Yeah. Okay. 
What do you think the apprehension is for girls when it comes to golf? It is a male-dominated sport. It is getting better. Yeah. And the Solheim Cup, which is coming here in September, I think is going to be amazing. What's that? So you've heard of the Ryder Cup. Yep. It's the female version. Okay. So it's the best players in Europe, the best players in America taking on each other. Ah! How important is it to you as a Scottish woman to have that tournament that's that prestigious in your country? Phenomenal. Like, I can't even put it into words. I just hope everyone turns up and supports the girls and we beat the USA <laughs> and bring it back to Europe. You know what? Me too. While I'm here, I actually hope you beat the USA too. You can be an adopted Scot that week. I, I think I already am. And just when you thought this corner of the country had you fully captivated, twin brothers Guy and Jamie McKenzie get you blown away. We're running outdoor activities on the beach. We do some surfing, some kayaking, some paddleboarding, land sailing, which is a three cart with a windsurfing sail. When it comes to the actual activity of land yachting, is it difficult? Is this something you're gonna have to have sailing experience on? Essentially, you pull the rope in with two hands, catches the wind, and you steer to make it go left and right. So once you catch the wind, you're using mother nature. You're sailing. To push yeah. you along. It's a green activity. Let's get sailing. Scotland is known for its beautiful coastlines. And I feel like you guys are providing people with the opportunity to see Scotland from a totally different vantage point. Yeah. Now this is the way to see Scotland! Woo!